you see to go ahead and open your Bibles to Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. Uh, this year we have this theme called Transform, and we're asking God not to sort of change us in slight, minor ways. We're asking that He would do major shifts. Major shifts in us, major shifts in relationships, major shifts in marriages, major shifts with our kids, major shifts in youth, and major shifts in our college students. That He would do major shifts in our community around us, that we would see Him in all of His glory and all of His power. And so, uh, most people think that the gateway to transformation is changing the way you think about yourself. But the Bible says that the, the entry point into being transformed is to change the way you think about God. And when you see Him in all of His glory and all of His goodness, and then you see yourself through His filter, everything changes. And so we've got this memory verse, this passage we're learning over the next couple of months. If, if you didn't get one of these, they're on the back counter back there. You can just get it. There's the verse on the back. You can put it over your speedometer so you don't see how fast you're going. Um, no, don't do that. Don't do that. But you can put it up in your bathroom, wherever you're going to see it the most, right? Uh, and, and I just want us to read this verse together. Hopefully we're starting to memorize little bits and pieces of it. And our goal is to memorize the whole thing and hide it in our hearts in this passage. This is the, the gateway to transformation. And it says, but when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. Would you read verse 17 with me? Here's what it says, verse 17. Uh, now the Lord is the Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom. And we all with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. And that's 2 Corinthians 3, 16 through 18. What we're praying is that we would see Jesus in all of his glory, in all of his majesty, in all of his wonder, that we would get such a big view of God that it can't help but change who we are. The Bible says it's like a veil is pulled away from our faces, and when we see him and behold him in all of his glory, then it's like we're automatically transformed from one degree of glory to the next. Each day you look a little bit more like Jesus than you did the day before. And so we started out this year going through uh, this series, the book of Colossians, called Head Games. We're in Colossians chapter 3 today. And, and the book of Colossians is just to show the superiority and the sufficiency of Jesus. That he's enough, that he's the greatest. And so we want to get this view of God, this greatness of God, so that he starts to transform us. And that's what we're doing in the book of Colossians. And so we said sometimes we play games with God. We act like there is no king or that we're the king. But the reality is that there is a king, and his name is Jesus. And he's done everything required to include you into his kingdom. And he longs for you to know him so deeply, to know the king so well, that you automatically start to think like he thinks and act like he acts in any situation. So you're living out his agenda on the earth. We said he's not just the king, but he's also the image of the invisible God. And he's the firstborn of all creation. He's the head over the church. And He's this great treasure. You'll never plumb the depths of Jesus. No matter how much you grow to know him, there will always be more to know about him because he's so amazing and so wonderful. And last week we talked about, about Jesus being the real deal. Now, why are you searching for a new deal when you've already experienced the real deal? Because if you get anything other than real deal, you walk away with a raw deal. And we talked about how Jesus was enough and how Paul's writing to to combat the false heresies that were going on in the church in Colossae, that Jesus is the real deal. You don't need to try to intercede with angels. You don't need to try to unlock some sort of super spirituality. Jesus is the highest, and, and you're already connected with him. And so all of these chapters that Paul's been writing is leading up to this point in chapter 3 where he says, he basically answers the question, so what now? Well, what does that look like? If, if Jesus is the king... If he's the image of the invisible God, if he's the firstborn of all creation, if he's the head of the church, if he's the treasure, if he's the real deal, and we believe that about Jesus, then what should our lives look like? What, what should that mean when we go to work on a Monday? What should that mean? What should that look like if we believe that's who Jesus is in our marriage on Tuesday? What should that look like in our parenting on Wednesday? What should that look like with our bank account next month? And so Paul wants to give this idea of a fleshed out life of, okay, if Jesus is the king and we believe all these great things about Jesus, then what should the life of a believer look like? And so that's what we're going to 
answer today in Colossians 3. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for who you are, and I thank you for your word. I pray that your Holy Spirit would speak to us, translate to each person's heart and each person's mind the exact thing that you want us all to hear in this place. In Jesus' name we all pray. Amen. Amen. How many of you have ever wished for a better version of yourself? Like a U2.0? Yeah. Uh, like, do you ever look back at your younger self and say, I wish I would have known then the things that I know now? Like, wow, could I be at a different place? Like, have you ever been there? Um, I was thinking back, I was seeing Stephen and Emmeline on the stage leading together. Isn't that so awesome? Like, at a, such a young age, together, married, leading people in worship for Jesus. I think that's so cool. But I was thinking back about when Katie and I first got married to a moment where I wished for a better version of myself. Uh, we, we were really young. I got married. I graduated a, a, a year early from college, and so I was 21. She was 20 years old, and we were young, had nothing, uh, and she was still in school at the time, and I was a, a youth pastor at a little small church, and I was working in a second job and doing stuff too, and, and um, we were going to have summer camp. I, I was too young to rent the church van, so I had to have an adult volunteer go with us because I couldn't legally drive it under their insurance. Uh, and so we ended up, we, we were getting ready to go to church camp, and we noticed our dog was super itchy. Now, this was our first, like, dog-owning experience together. You know, first you get the dog, and then eventually you have the kids, like, you got a five-year plan, right? All those things. And so we had this dog, her name was Hope, and she starts itching and stuff, and we're just like, we don't really think anything about it. But then right before we leave, we start to see some fleas on the dog. And so we treat the dog, but we don't do anything in our apartment complex. Now, our apartment... We had a two-bedroom apartment. You could sit on the sofa and change the channel on the TV. Like, it was so small. It was an amazing, amazing place. I totally recommend it. Be young, poor, and married. Like, it's an awesome experience for your life. It'll to totally grow you to look like Jesus. Um, and so we, we leave, and I don't do anything to fix the flea situation. My thought was, it'll fix itself, right? I mean, the dog is not here for a week. Like, surely they'll die off. A and so uh, we went to the camp. We came back. And uh, it had been a week, and somehow I ended up with the rental van that I was going to return because our adult volunteer couldn't do it, so I was just going to illegally drive it in. So it's parked at our apartment complex, and we walk into the door of our apartment, and all of a sudden I start to feel these, like, bites on my leg. And I'm like, what is that? And I start smacking myself, and I'm like, is something biting you, babe? And she's like, something is biting me. Is something biting you? And everywhere we went in our apartment, like, they were all over our leg. Like, I'm not kidding. It was an infestation at that point. Like, they had, there had been a nuclear explosion of fleas. I don't know what happened. And so it's midnight. I'm driving to Walmart getting a flea bomb. And, and all we were so tired. It was like after camp, all this emotional experience and counseling kids all week long. And all we wanted to do was sleep in our bed. And guess where we slept that night? The rental van uh, with our dog with our dog while the flea bomb went off and poisoned all of our neighbors. It was awesome. So, but in that moment, I was wishing for a better version of me. Like, oh, I wish I would have addressed it before we left for camp. I, I wish for a 2.0 version of me. And I, I, I got to tell you, as I look around Christianity today and I see all of this, the books that are written, I, to me, it almost feels more like self-help than it does actual gospel. It's almost all about how to be a better you, how, how to be a better version of yourself, how to live your best life right here and right now, almost like creating your own little slice of heaven here on earth and forgetting that there is a real heaven that awaits. And, and, and as I thought about this thing, like even on our motivations for doing better, it's like, oh, I, I want to be better. I want to do better, right? Like how many of you have that conversation with yourself January 1st every year? It's like, I want to do better with my weight this year. I want to do better with exercise. I want to do better with whatever. I want to be a better me, right? And, and as I'm thinking about this thing, this question has haunted me all week long this week. And I, and I hope it just stays in your brain too. I just, this is my only point for today. I just want you to write this down. And I want you to think about this question. Is your goal to see a better you or to reflect a clearer Jesus? Is your goal in life like to be a better you, to see a better you, a better version of yourself? Or is your goal to reflect a clearer Jesus? 
Paul talks about all these things about Jesus being the king and the head and the firstborn, all this stuff. He's the real deal. And he says, so this is how you should live. But so many of us, I think, view Christianity almost like a little checklist that you go through. And it's like, here's the do's, here's the don'ts, and I'm going to do these things and maybe earn God's favor. I want to tell you, you've already got his favor. You've already got it. Like, you, no matter what you've done, no matter where you've gone, no matter how many times you've blown it, he loves you with an everlasting love. And if you know Jesus, remember we had the receipt last week, like it's paid in full. It was nailed to the cross. He canceled your debt. You don't have to earn God's favor. But what we should do is out of a life of gratitude to the king, we, we should so long to live in a way, not that we see a better us, but that reflects to the world a clearer Jesus. And so I want you to see what Paul talks about here in Colossians chapter 3. Here's, here's what it says. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is. Seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things that are above and not on the things that are on earth. He says get fixated on Jesus. Get fixated on, on what eternal priorities are going to be. How, how many of you have kids in the room? Like, have you ever had the toddler that won't shut up asking for the same thing over and over and over? And it's like, it doesn't matter if you put them in the timeout chair or whatever it is, or you swat their, their booty. Uh, it's, it's, the, no social workers in here. Uh, but it's like, no matter what you do, right? It's like they're fixated on that thing. I got to have that thing, and the world is going to end if I don't get that thing. How many of you remember being in middle school and having your crush, right? Like, and it's, uh, or high school, or some of you are from college. I don't know, whatever it is. But like, oh, if I could just be with this person, life would be so amazing. Like you, you, you dream about it and you're, you're fixated on what life would look like with another person. Some of you, like you're fixated on, on a career, right? It's like, oh, if I could just get this job, then I'd be the big boss. Then I could do whatever I want. Other people would do all the real work and I could just take their credit for it. But it, like you, you go through and you say all these things, you get fixated. And he says, listen, there's so many things in this life that your mind can be fixed on. Fix your mind on Jesus and on his eternal priorities because all this stuff is going to die. All of it. All of it. It's got an expiration date on every bit of it. But the things with Jesus last forever. Look at what he says at the next verse. Verse 3. Because you've died and your life's hidden with Christ and God. You could do a whole sermon on what it means to be hidden with Christ and God. It's that you're wrapped up in Jesus. You're in the palm of the Father's hand. Nothing you ever do, no person, no thing can ever take you out of the grasp of your great God. Look what he says. When Christ, who is your life, appears, you'll also appear with him in glory. He says, he's your whole life. And there's going to be a life that ends here and then starts and lasts forever, times forever, times forever. Look, look I don't know how many of you think you're going to live to 100. How many of you feel like you'll probably do it? You'll probably do it. I, I don't have a prayer. I don't think it's happening. I'm too accident prone. Like, all right. But, but listen, like, even if you live to 100, or they come up with some crazy nanotechnology that repairs you inside and out, and you live to 150, like, you make it to that long, and everybody else is dead around you, and, like, you don't know a soul, and you wish for death. Like, at that point, you die, and then you start with God forever, times forever, times forever, times forever, infinity squared, like, it's, it, it's unimaginable. Like, our life is this long, and then it's gone. Compared to the great life you get with Jesus that lasts for an eternity. He says, why are you so fixated on what happens in 40 years? Instead of thinking about what's going to last forever, times forever, times forever, times forever. He's, he's your real life. Look at what it says, the next verse. I love it. Verse 5. So in light of all that, what should we do as believers? Verse 5. So put to death, therefore, what's earthly in you. Sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. Read verse 7 with me. What does it say? In these, you two once walked when you were living. He says, this used to be your identity. This used to be who you were, little sinner. But you're not anymore. Like, that's not who you are. That's not your identity anymore. I can't stand that when people say, like, oh, I'm just a sinner saved by grace. No, that cheapens what Jesus did for you on the cross. That cheapens it all. You're not a sinner saved by grace anymore. You are an adopted child of the king who used to be a sinner. Now, as an adopted child of the king, you sometimes sin, but that doesn't define you. 
and that's not your identity anymore. He says, you used to walk in these things, and you used to own them. He says, it's almost like you had on all these clothes, like these sinful clothes, like sexual immorality. That's any sort of sexual contact or sexual thought or sexual feeling that, that goes to a place of lust or anything that's beyond a husband and a wife. He says, this used to be you. You used to burn with passion. You wanted to live your own life. You wanted to do your own thing. You, you had this greed about you. And here's what greed literally means. Everything on the planet is there to please you. That's what you think. Like, do you remember the verse, everything is created by him and for who? For him, for Jesus. But you look at it and you're like, that's for me. Like that stuff, that's for me. That relationship, that's for me. The, the kids, that's for me. That house, that's for me. That's for me. For me, 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 me. And he says, instead of it all being for God, you say it's all for me. He says, that's how you used to walk around. It was like you wore all these clothes. Like you look silly, right? But then something happened. Jesus came to you and woke you up to a brand new way of life. Your old man died and was buried away. And all of those clothes that you were wearing, all those sins that defined and identified you, it was buried away in the grave alongside of you. So why do you keep putting on dead men's clothes? He's like, you got a brand new way of life. You're over here walking around totally brand new. And he said, here's what some of us are doing. The things that used to define us, they can't define us anymore. Like, that's not who we are. That's not a part of who our identity is in Christ. But here's what we do. We go over to the grave and we shovel off a little dirt. And then we pull off those old sin clothes. And it's like, man, these are my comfies. Do, do you have those? Like, after you go to the buffet, you know what I mean? It's like you got your stretchies on. Like, you come home and it's like, these are my comfies. Like, he says, you look at that old way of life and you say, oh, it's so comfortable. Oh, that's just because it was part of who you were. For so long, and he says, but that's not part of you anymore. But here you are, like you go over and you're just like taking off the clothes of the dead man and you put it on your brand new alive self. And he's like, that's not who you're meant to be. That's not who you're meant to be. You got to put that stuff to death. And look what he says. He keeps going. There's this struggle that he talks about. Look what he says. Now you must put them all away. Anger, wrath malice slander obscene talk from your mouth don't lie to one another seeing that you put off the old self with its practices read verse 10 and put on the new self which is what being renewed in knowledge after the image of who it's great it's not a better you it's a clearer jesus he says every day you're putting on these new things like he's like don't put on old dead clothes Put on new clothes. Put on the things that are part of your new identity. Because Jesus gave you a brand new identity. So wear those things. Put on those things because every day he's making you look a little bit more like Jesus and a little less like you. Look at what he says. He keeps going. He says, here there's no Greek or Jew, circumcised, uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free. But Christ is all. And in all, is your goal to see a better you or to reflect a clear Jesus? He says, you got to put away anger. I love this. Um, how many of you are hotheads? I'll raise my hand. Yeah. Uh, you ever start out a day at a nine? You ever start out a day at a nine and you're just hoping somebody takes you to a ten? You know what I mean? It's just like <laughs> simmering under the surface of the pot. And you're like, just let somebody, let one of those kids back talk to me. I'm going to send them to you, Jesus, like in the moment. Right? You know, it's just like, I'm at a nine, and you just push me on over the edge to a tent. That's anger. But then he says, wrath, that's a rage. That's, that, that's where the anger, somebody did throw something in the pot, and you came spilling out. Right? Look, look at what else he says, malice. That's, that's ill will. Toward some, wishing ill to happen to somebody else. Like on I-77, you know, when they're tailgating you, and then like they fly around you and they're doing 90 and you're like I really hope you get a ticket like that's you know it's like I hope you get a flat tire on the way to work and you're late for a meeting and you get fired like that's malice not that any of you would ever do that but I'm just saying like that's ill will it's wishing ill will towards somebody have you ever wished ill will towards your spouse in the moment in the heat of anger in the heat of the moment where you're just you're thinking ill will and ill thoughts like not for their good but for their destruction, you know, that's the destruction of you too, right? And then he says, that's not who you are anymore. Those things don't define you. 
That, that used to be who you were, but that's not who you are now. That used to be a part of your identity, but it's not part of your identity anymore. It feels normal. It feels natural. It feels like you're just sort of wearing the old clothes. But he says, those, those are dead man's clothes. Don't put those back on. When we say obscene talk, that's abusive language. That's, that's downing other people around you and lifting yourself up. He says, that's not who you are anymore. But I love this. Look what he says. He never tells you to take something off without telling you to put something back on. And the thing he tells you to put on is so much better than the stuff he's telling you to take off. Verse 12, I think we're missing the slide, but on your Bibles it says, Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against each other, forgiving each other, as the Lord has forgiven you, so you can choose to forgive if you want to. Is that what it says? No, what does it say? As the Lord has forgiven you, so you what? Must also forgive. He says, listen, don't go over there and unbutton the clothes off the dead man and put them on saying, well, that's just who I am. It's not who you are. It's who you used to be. Here's the things that are reality of who you are, your new identity in Christ, your new nature in Christ. He says, you put on these things. And here's what he means. Look right here. He means if you believe Jesus is king over every area of life, you can't have any area of your life that's yours. Right? He's saying, like, there's no area where it's like, well, you manage that, Jesus, and I got this. He's like, no, no, no. He's Lord over it all. He's Lord over every single bit of it. And here's what he says. Don't take off these things because these are actually unnatural. Even though they feel comfortable, here's what you need to do. You listen to the Holy Spirit's voice. And when you're walking in the spirit and you're remembering who Jesus is, here's the things that will pop out of you. Right? Like Paul in Galatians calls it the fruit of the spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Just If you're surrendered to Jesus and you're listening to his voice and remembering he's the king and you're not, here's the things that pop out of your life. And this is what he says. Look, look at what pops out of your life. He says compassion pops out of your life. Compassion. Do you know what this means? Like literally... It means, uh, it, it means bowels of mercy. Like they, they didn't use the heart in that culture to, to really define the deepest parts of yourself. They used the bowels because they would say, you move me. I'm sorry, that's a really bad joke. That's bad. That's bad. That's bad. But, that's, but it's true. They would, use, they would use the bowels. That was the seat of everything. At your very core, it was the bowels. And they would say, like, do you have these new normals these bowels of mercy when you look at people is your first thought judgment is your first thought analyzing them is your first thought figuring them out or man i'm so glad i'm not like or is your first thought tenderness and compassion bowels of mercy and he says it doesn't just stay compassion but it moves to kindness kindness is an action it's like benevolent mercy it's doing something with the feeling that you have and, and it's not just that it's humility listen if there's something the world needs now more than ever it's humility have you been online i'm just telling you like it amazes me the arrogance of people of all stripes of all places of all different backgrounds everything like the arrogance of people sometimes i read stuff like on twitter or on facebook or instagram and i'm thinking do you actually believe people care about what you think i mean like who do you think you are like you're nobody i mean like it's like nobody cares what you think but apparently people do because they get so riled up about it it's like well no i have to say my opinion and then it's like humility he, he says if you're filled to the top of you're remembering you're walking in the spirit bowels of mercy tenderness kindness and humility and then he says patience patience to bear with one another he's like you'll be able to stand up underneath other people's garbage without giving in to sin that's amazing he says forgiving just as you've been forgiven he says these are the things that that pop out even when you have been totally wrong even you have a right to a complaint here's what you say i'm not holding this against you because i trust there's a king and he's sovereign and he does a much better job of repaying than i ever could so either he's going to repay by bringing your heart to a repentance or he's going to repay by you being punished but either way he's going to take care of it better than i can 
Do you see it? He says, these are your new clothes. This is the default of who you are. Like you're dressed up in kindness. You're dressed up in compassion. You're dressed up in mercy. You're dressed up in patience. These are the things that just pop out of you if you're listening to the Holy Spirit because that's who you are. That's part of your new identity. So he says, every day you have this choice. Are are you going to put on the old dead clothes or are you going to walk around in the new duds that Christ has given you? Look what he says. We're going to close in verse 14. Above all these things, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you are called one body. Be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms, hymns, spiritual songs with thankfulness to God in your hearts. Read verse 17 with me and we're done. And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of God. Of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. He says, Everything you do bears and reflects His name. It's not about you or being a better you. Here, here's what it is. I, uh, let me see if I can find it again. Where is it? There it is. Fantastic. I used to work with props for a living. All right, here we go. You ready? Do you ever uh, walk by a mirror and say, is that what I really look like? Oh, man, that's terrible. Um, Okay, so here's what he's saying. Every day you wake up and you look in the mirror and you remind yourself who you are and whose you are. You're not your own. You're bought with a price. You have a dead man who's laying in a grave. And your choice every single day, don't miss this. Look, am I going to go undress the dead man and put on the old dead man's clothes and say, It's my life. I can do whatever I want to do. Oh, I mean, I want to be a better version of me, so maybe I'll just take off one layer. But, like, I've got these other layers. And even though that's not my identity anymore, that's the representation I'm going to present to the world. That This person who says he's brand new, but he's dressed up in old dead man's clothes. Or instead, am I going to go with the new duds that God's given me? I'm going to be surrendered to your Holy Spirit because every single thing I do bears your name. It's not about a better version of me. I want the whole world to see when they look at me and they see compassion. I want them to see your compassion. When they look at me and they see kindness, the only reason I'm kind is because Jesus has been so kind to me. The only reason that I want them to see anything about me is to reflect to them who who you are. Every time they look at me, I want it to be this giant reflection of you. Because I bear your name. I'm this new person. I've got these new things that are part of my new identity. So I want to walk in that. I'm not going to go digging up old dead man's clothes and wearing that saying, look at me. At least, at least I don't do that anymore. But no, I, want to, I don't want to be a better me. I want to reflect a clear Jesus. So the world knows you're the deal. So the world knows you're the real deal. Lord, would you make it so? In us, let's pray. This morning, I just want to ask you, is there any area in your life where you're unbuttoning the clothes of your old dead man or woman and you're putting them on like they're still a part of you? Is there anything like that for you? I mean, Paul lists out sexual immorality or greed. He lists out anger and wrath and impatience. But it could be anything. Only you know what that is. It's probably different for all of us. But is there any area of your life where you're content, instead of walking out the new identity that he's given you, where you're content to go over and just kind of unbutton the clothes of the dead man and say, well, yeah, but I just, I, I want to be a better me. I want to be a better version of me, but you know, I'm still wearing some dead clothes around. If there's any area for you that's like that, the Bible says that we should confess it as sin to God. We should confess our sins. He's faithful and just to forgive us of those and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If that's you, you just, would, would you just lift that up to him? Maybe for you, you say, well, I really feel like a dead man. I'm, I've never really experienced a brand new way of life. The Bible says that the way to life is by surrender to Jesus. 
Maybe you've never, ever done that. Today's the day for you to take that step. Maybe you just whisper these words. This is no magic prayer. There's no magic formula. It's all about what the Holy Spirit is doing in you. But if it all makes sense that Jesus did something for you on the cross, he forgave you. And when he came back from the dead, it meant something for you. And you want to surrender to him so he can give you a brand new way of life. Just Would you just tell him, I surrender? Just tell him right now, I surrender surrender I believe what you did on the cross was for me I believe when you came back from the dead it meant something for me I surrender I believe in you Jesus give me a new way of life by sending your Holy Spirit to live in me if you prayed that just take that response card put your name and address on the top part of that put a check mark in the box says I prayed to receive Christ just leave that in your seat our ushers will grab that send you a book in the mail about what you do now that you've started this journey with Jesus I, 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 I want to hear about it so please make sure you leave that there so we can help you and walk alongside of you but for those of you that have been believers a really long time let me just ask you what, what do we need to confess are, are we trying to see a better us or are we trying to reflect a clearer Jesus everything about us points to him Everything about our heart points to Him. Everything about our behavior points to Jesus. So the world knows He's real, that He's the King, that He's the real deal, that He's the head, the firstborn, the mystery, the treasure. So let's put the old dead man clothes back in the grave. Every day, when we wake up, every day this week, when you walk by a mirror, Ask yourself this question, am I trying to see a better me or reflect a clearer Jesus? Let's put on the clothes of our brand new identity. Jesus, would you make it so in us? So the world knows you're real. Let's ask you to set us.